And I'd like to also thank the KCA organizer, organizers, the leadership uh, of Bill Pro and Gary Konoski for putting this together. These are my disclosures. So as you saw in Dr. Wood's uh, talk, the treatment landscape for renal cell carcinoma has witnessed a revolution in a very short period of time. In seven years, we saw the approval by the FDA of seven agents after a drought of 13 years since the approval of high dose IL-2. Within a month, Sorafenib and sunitinib came to the market in December 2005 for sorafenib, and in January 2006, sunitinib was FDA approved. In 2007, the first mTOR inhibitor, Temsirolimus, was approved. And in 2009, we saw the approval of three agents or three therapies, Everolimus, Bevacizumab plus interferon alpha, and pazopinib. And in January 2012, axitinib was FDA approved. This slide summarizes for you the targeted therapies that are licensed in the U.S. for treatment of metastatic renal cell cancer. I'd like to draw your attention that two of these, Everolimus and Axitinib, are approved for the second line or salvage therapy. And the other five are approved, as you see in the, uh, the right-hand column, for the treatment of metastatic renal cell carcinoma, irrespective of line. You see here the uh, targets of these different therapies, the uh, route of administration. Five of these are oral, two are intravenous, and you see also the target of these agents. Now, four of these are what we refer to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These are the uh, drugs that uh, are taken by mouth and they target the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, specifically uh, VEGF receptor. And two belong to the class of mTOR inhibitors. This is a summary of the first line phase three trials conducted for the metastatic renal cell carcinoma. The top two combine bevacizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against VEGF and interferon alpha, then pazopanib, sunitinib, tivazanib, and axitinib are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, as I mentioned. And tamsirolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. You see the control arm in the fourth uh, column, and then the number of patients enrolled on these trials on each of these arms, and the primary endpoint. I think I would like to discuss the bottom two trials first, because these are drugs that were not uh, approved for the indication they were conducted in, and that's tivozanib and axitinib. Tivozanib uh, and, tivo and axitinib are referred to as uh, novel or second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors because they are more potent against the primary target, VEGF receptors, and they are uh, more selective. They do not have the uh, off targets, the other kinases that the sunitinib, sorafenib, and pazopanib, the older generation or first generation, have. The, these two trials, tivozanib and axitinib, were compared to sorafenib in the first line, and you see the number of patients, and they had, they had for primary endpoint progression-free survival. They did not meet the primary endpoint because the uh, axitinib had a 78% aim of improving progression-free survival compared to sorafenib. That was an ambitious goal. And this was, uh, the idea was to do the trial faster and to do it uh, in a smaller number of patients. Uh, and unfortunately, the, while axitinib had a longer progression-free survival than sorafenib, it did not meet the endpoint of 78% improvement. So it was not FDA approved for the first line treatment of patients with metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Tivozanib versus sorafenib, while the primary endpoint was met, which was progression-free survival and was improved with the second generation tivozanib versus sorafenib. However, however, the problem with the trial is that patients who were treated with sorafenib in the first line 
had the opportunity to cross over after progressing on sorafenib and receive tivozanib, while patients who received tivozanib in the first line, very few of them crossed over to receive a second line therapy. So it ended up being, when you look at survival, it ended up being comparing a group of patients receiving one line of therapy, and that's tivozanib, versus a group of patients that received two lines of therapy, therapy, sorafenib followed by tivozanib. So the survival of the group of patients who received sorafenib was better than the survival of patients who received tivozanib in the first line. So that's why the FDA did not approve tivozanib. And we'll move on and discuss briefly the other trials, starting with sinitinib. This was a phase three trial comparing patients with uh, interferon alpha, the old standard, given at the standard dose and schedule nine million three times per week, versus sunitinib, 50 milligram daily on the standard schedule of four weeks on two weeks off. It was a large phase three trial of 750 patients. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And patients were recruited to the trial if they had, you see the box there, of eligibility criteria, predominantly uh, clear cell and no prior systemic therapy, measurable disease, good performance status, and adequate organ function. The secondary endpoints were overall survival, objective response rate, patient reported outcomes, and safety. And you see the Kaplan-Meier curve showing that patients treated with sinitinib, represented here in blue, had a better progression-free survival, a median of 11 months, versus five months median progression-free survival for patients treated with interferon alpha. This was a statistically significant difference between the two arms. Then we have two trials combining bevacizumab plus interferon. These were very similar in design, represented in this schema here. One was conducted in the US by the CALGB inter, uh, 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 cooperative group and included 732 patients, and one was conducted mostly in Europe by Avorin, the Avorin trial. It had 649 patients. The difference between these two uh, studies is that uh, patients with Avor uh, on the Avorin trial were required to have prior nephrectomy before enrolling on the trial. And uh, the treatment also comprised placebo in addition to bevacizumab, placebo for bevacizumab, whereas the CLGB did not mandate prior nephrectomy and there was no placebo control. Primary endpoint of the trial was OS, secondary endpoints PFS, objective response rate, and safety. And you, as you see here in the two Kaplan-Meier curves for the Avorin study, as well as the CLGB trial study, patients treated with the combination of bevacizumab plus interferon had a better progression-free survival, represented in the green curve, compared to patients who were treated with just interferon alpha or interferon alpha plus placebo. However, Patients did not have a superior survival. The survival of patients on these two arms was not significant. And the reason was patients after coming off these two trials were, had the opportunity to receive other target therapies and that confounded the survival. Same thing we saw with the pre previous trial I showed you with sinitinib versus interferon. While there was a trend for improvement of overall survival in the patient street with sinitinib compared to interferon alpha, this was, did not cross the threshold of becoming statistically significant. Again, because patients received other target agents after coming off PRAL. And then there was 25 patients who were crossed over from uh, interferon to sinitinib. The other phase three trial was the uh, global ARCC trial. This was a phase three trial of Temsiralmus, the mTOR inhibitor, versus interferon alpha versus the combination of Temsiralmus plus interferon alpha. The primary endpoint of this trial was overall survival. Patients were recruited who had any histological type of RCC. 80% of those uh, patients had the common type, clear cell or conventional histology, and 20% had the other non-clear, what we refer to as non-clear cell histology. But importantly, for patients to be eligible for the trial, they had to have three or more risk factors to uh, enroll in the trial. And here you see the Kaplan-Meier curves, again showing a separation of the curves. Patients treated with Temsirolimus had a superior survival 
compared to patients who were treated with interferon, represented in blue, or the combination represented in pink. The median survival for patients treated with Temsiralmus was 10.9 months versus 7.3 months median overall survival for patients treated with interferon alpha, an improvement of 49%. So that led to the FDA approval of this agent for RCC. The next study was uh, the Pazopenib phase three study. This was a study conducted or sponsored by uh, Glasgow Smith Klein. It, it was conducted uh, mostly in Europe. Patients had to have clear cell histology, but there were two cohorts of patients. Uh, one cohort previously treated with cytokines and one cohort uh, treatment naive. There was two to one randomization in that Two patients were randomized to receive pazopanib versus placebo. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And here are, you, here are the curves for patients treated with pazopanib, represented in the yellow curve. The median progression-free survival was 11 months. Again, similar to what you saw uh, in the study uh, with sunitinib versus interferon alpha. Patients treated with placebo had a median survival of about three months. Again, significant difference, and this was uh, uh, led to the approval of pazopanib. Again, as, we, as I mentioned with the other trials, 48% of patients treated with placebo when they had progressive disease with placebo were, uh, were given the opportunity to cross over and receive pazopanib after progression. And this led to, again, the confounding impact on survival. When you look at uh, median survival for these two cohorts, there was no statistically significant difference in overall survival, again, because of the crossover and subsequent therapies patients received uh, after the study. So of what I mentioned, it looked like the two front runners for, uh, for the treatment of metastatic RCC in the first line were sinitinib, where you had the best re results, and pazopinib, where you had also the best results. So these were uh, the two front runners. Although bevacizumab plus interferon had, you would think, comparable efficacy, it did not catch on in terms of applicability uh, in the clinic because patients had to receive, would have to receive an infusion every two weeks plus injection of interferon three times per week. So it was uh, no surprise that uh, uh, GSK decided to have this trial that we call compare trial, comparing the two front runners, pazopinib versus sunitinib, for first line treatment of metastatic real cell carcinoma. This was a large phase three trial of 1,110 patients uh, con conducted in multiple continents. It had a design of non inferiority for progression free survival. In other words, they wanted to show if pazopinib is non-inferior to sinitinib when it comes to efficacy, looking at the progression-free survival as primary endpoint. And there were secondary endpoints, overall survival, objective response rate, duration of response, safety, and quality of life. And here are the results. Pazopinib was found to be not inferior to sinitinib. And uh, if looking at the progression-free survival, which was the primary endpoint, and when you look at the secondary survival, which is important, secondary endpoint, the sur median survival for patients treated with pazopinib and sunitinib was similar, about two and a half years. However, very importantly, there were uh, differences in toxicity and quality of life. Uh, in 16 out of 16 quality of life domains, pazopinib was felt to be uh, better tolerated by improved quality of life uh, tools compared to sunitinib, and toxicity favored pazopinib because it had, uh, patients had less fatigue and less hand foot skin reaction, less myelosuppression. The next study that uh, GSK uh, sponsored, and this was recently published in, in the uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology, this was a patient preference. It was a double blind design comparing pazopinib versus sunitinib in a double blind fashion. So the patient didn't know what they were taking and the physicians treating them did not know what they were taking. And ultimately, patients were told at the end of the study which drug did they prefer, 
Was it the first one, which was given for 10 weeks, then two weeks break, then they switched, or the, the other way around? So this was 160 patient trial, so it was a phase two trial, and the results were in favor of pazapenib by a margin of 70% to 20%. Also in blue, this was tracked by the physicians, 61 versus 22% uh, of patients, again, uh, physicians also uh, preferred or voted for uh, pazapenib as the preferred agent. But the story doesn't end here because quality of life tools were administered uh, in the previous trial compares at a time at the end of the cycle for sunitinib, 29 days, every 29 days. And that, for patients who have received sunitinib, will tell you that this is the peak when they have the most adverse events. So now, after eight years of uh, sunitinib, uh, we have alternative uh, set schedule to give this drug. Instead of the standard four weeks on, two weeks off, retrospective uh, study from our institution, as well as other institutions, have shown that patients who receive sunitinib with the two weeks on, one week, one week off schedule, have less adverse events. And there is a suggestion that patients will have a better survival because they can stay on treatment longer. So the, the jury is still out, which would be the preferred agent up front. I think there is no question that both drugs are good drugs. Now, what about second line and beyond? I will go quickly through those phase three trials. This was the first trial uh, with the target agents. The target trial compared sorafenib versus placebo in patients who had cytokine and uh, prior therapy. The primary endpoint was OS, secondary endpoint was progression-free survival. And here are the coupling mild curves. In blue are patients treated with sorafenib. In uh, red are patients treated with placebo. There was a statistically significant difference in progression-free survival. Patients with a treat with sorafenib had a median progression-free survival of 5.5 months compared to 2.8 months. But the overall survival, because again, as happens with the other trials, there was a crossover at progression. There was no statistically significant difference between the two arms. The record one, phase three trial, compared everolimus after sunitinib or sorafenib versus placebo. This was a two to one randomization. Again, twice the number of patients were randomized to receive everolimus plus best supportive care versus placebo plus best supportive care. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival, and again, the results were in favor of everolimus over placebo. Again, these are patients who were treated previously with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, either sorafenib or sinitinib. The other study, phase three trial, was uh, the AXIS study, and it randomized patients to receive either axitinib or sorafenib after receiving either sunitinib first line, or bevacizumab plus interferon, or temsirolimus, or, or a cytokine. And then the results are here. Patients treated with axitinib, represented in yellow curve, had an improved progression-free survival with a median of 6.7 months compared to sorafenib with a median of 4.7 months. However, it's important to note that the best results were uh, in patients who received axitinib after receiving a prior immunotherapy. So uh, the median progression-free survival with axitinib after immunotherapy was 12 months. If you look at giving axitinib after sinitinib, the uh, median progression-free survival was 4.8 months. But all of these were in favor of axitinib. There is an important study that compared temsirolimus and sorafenib. So this is the first time we're comparing an mTOR inhibitor versus sorafenib in the second line after sunitinib. So all these patients here were treated with sunitinib first and had progressive disease, and then now they are assigned to receiving either the mTOR inhibitor, temsirolimus, or sorafenib. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And then when you see the curves, although numerically temsirolimus had a better uh, progression-free survival, uh, median 4.28 versus 3.9, this was not statistically significant. But what was statistically significant and of concern was the survival was surprising and unanticipated in that patients who were treated with sorafenib after sunitinib, so TKI after TKI, had a four-month difference, improved 
survival compared to patients who received tempsirolimus. So suggesting that maybe given a TKI followed by TKI, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor against VGF, would be a better strategy than giving a TKI followed by an mTOR inhibitor. The last phase three trial I would like to show is this uh, GOLDS trial. It's a phase three trial of dovitinib versus sovrafenib in patients with clear cell carcinoma who had a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor for first line, an mTOR inhibitor, Evronimus for the second line, and then they are randomized to receive either this BFGF receptor inhibitor because the BFGF is, was implicated to be a pathway responsible for resistance to, to uh, angiogenesis inhibitor versus sorafenib. The, the results were negative in that the progression-free survival was not statistically significantly different between the two arms. Patients receiving third-line dovitinib, the BFGF receptor inhibitor, had a median PFS of 3.7 months compared to 3.6 months with sorafenib. Survival median was 11 months for both arms. And the response rate with each agent was very low, 4%. So what about combinations and sequential therapies? In one word, there is no combination of two target agents that is uh, uh, more helpful or more efficient, more effective than uh, a, a single agent, except for the combination of bifacizumab plus interferon alpha that I discussed. So the question is, if patients uh, do not achieve a uh, complete response, does it matter what you start with? And here are trials that are, ask, are addressing that question. This is a trial conducted in Germany. It was presented two months ago at the ASCO GU, <clears throat> comparing two sequences of two tyrosine kinase inhibitors, sorafenib followed by sunitinib versus sunitinib followed by sorafenib. The results were not surprising. While the uh, patients who received sunitinib first had a two-month improvement of their progression-free survival compared to sorafenib, when you look at time on therapy, from first line to second line, there was no significant difference between the two arms. The record three is a phase two trial comparing an mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus, versus sinitinib. This was presented at ASCO last year. It has not been published yet. The results show superiority of sinitinib over Everolimus in the first line. And there is also concern here, similar to what we saw with the intersect when we give them sirolimus in the second line after a tyrosine kinase is inhibited. The patients who received Everolimus first followed by sunitinib, there was a trend for inferior survival compared to patients who received sunitinib followed by Everolimus. Now, toxicity is an unpleasant and uh, unwelcome uh, uh, thing patients have to go through when they are receiving these therapies, but this is uh, a double-edged sword. Patients have if they have developed the hypertension or hypothyroidism, hand, foot, skin reaction, fatigue with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we looked at these and we find that patients who have these actually do better than patients who do not de develop these toxicities. So while toxicities may be, uh, are definitely uh, uh, untoward and unpleasant and unwelcome, they suggest that patients who develop these toxicities have a better uh, outcome or response, respond better to these therapies. We and others showed that uh, in response to mTOR inhibitors, developing pneumonitis is associated with also improved survival in patients treated with the mTOR inhibitors. These patients who develop hypercholesterolemia while receiving everolimus or temsorolimus also are predicted to, to do better. What about non clear cell? These are, this is the list of the 2004 WHO classification of the uh, renal tumors, you know, papillary, chromophobe, uh, translocation, renal medullary, collecting duct, mucinous tubular spindle cell, and others. What do we do for these patients? As I showed you, the majority of the trials in RCC have been conducted in clear cell. What about the non-clear cell? In a word, there is no established therapy for the non-clear cell. That's why it's important to, to do these clinical trials. And these, this is a list of some of these ongoing phase two trials in non-clear cell RCC. I'd like to briefly show you some of these trials we're doing here at MD Anderson. This is the ESPN trial, or Everimus versus Sunitinib prospective evaluation in non-clear cell RCC. 
We just com uh, completed accrual in this trial, and it's been selected for oral presentation at ASCO. Patients with non-clear cell, uh, RCC with metastatic disease, are randomized to receiving Everolimus, the mTOR inhibitor, versus sunitinib, and at disease progression that cross over, results will be presented at ASCO, so uh, maybe uh, next year I'll share with you those results. We are still conducting the STAR trial, and this is a sequential two-agent assessment in renal cell carcinoma therapy in patients with clear cell who have already had their nephrectomy. We're looking at six sequences. We chose three drugs, one representing each class, bevacizumab representing the antibody against the EGF, pazopanib, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and everolimus, the mTOR inhibitor. The, the goal of, and the goals of these trials is to come to precision medicine, try to identify patients who respond to one of these agents and try to understand why patients who respond to, the, to one of these agents lose their response and have progressive disease. So this is a very tissue-rich uh, trial with a lot of uh, uh, correlative studies that will be uh, crucial and informative once we complete the trial. We're at 170 patients for a total of 240 patients. The TEMPA trial is an ongoing trial for clear cell RCC patients who have poor risk disease, and it's comparing pazapanib versus the standard of care for patients with poor risk, the temsorolimus. We have 30 patients enrolled on the trial toward a goal of 90 patients. So conclusion, we have seven target agents that have been approved. Improvement in progression-free survival has been shown with all agents, and improvement in OS with one agent, temsorolimus, but complete responses are rare. Early and active management of adverse events will minimize those delays, those reductions, or treatment discontinuations, and may impact long-term benefit. Adverse events may be predictive biomarkers of therapeutic benefit. Sequential therapy is the standard of care in 2014, but the optimal sequence tyrosine kinase inhibitor followed by tyrosine kinase inhibitor or tyrosine kinase inhibitor followed by mTOR inhibitor remains to be determined. There is no established systemic therapy for advanced non-clear cell RCC, unfortunately, but the hope is that insights into the biology of real cell carcinoma will be essential and will help us to identify relevant targets and improved uh, therapies. There is still a role, as you will hear later from my colleague, Dr. Gao, for uh, old immunotherapy with high-dose IL-2, and there is a promising uh, wave of agents on the horizon with the immune checkpoint blockade, nivolumab and uh, ipilimumab, and they represent the next strategy for achieving a breakthrough in the treatment of metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Trials combining novel immune therapies with each other and target therapies are ongoing. In the era of target therapy, is there a cure for a patient with metastatic renal cell carcinoma? I would like to finish on a positive note because I'd like to leave you with a message of hope. This is a patient that I saw from Pensacola, Florida, eight years ago, presented with hematuria, weight loss, left varicocele, and workup showed a mass in his left kidney. We were going to enroll him on one of the trials Dr. Wood showed you, pre-surgical uh, trial with bevacizumab. Unfortunately, we found he had metastasis in the brain, so he was not eligible. So we went on and treated him with sorafenib because that was the first agent that came out, and he received it for 16 weeks, had transient response, and had progressive disease. And developed, in addition to the brain metastasis and lung metastasis, which I'll show you, he developed metastasis in bone and liver. So we started him with sunitinib. And you can see here, after uh, several months of treatment with sunitinib, his uh, metastatic disease in the lungs resolved, metastatic disease in the brain resolved. The primary tumor, as you see, shrank significantly, and the metastatic disease and the lymph nodes improved, as you can see, in the liver resolved, in the bone healed. You could see the hole in his uh, thoracic, in his uh, lumbar vertebra, how the new bone formation. Brain, without treating him for the brain with radiation, whole brain radiation or surgery or gamma knife, the tumors in the brain resolved. And look at the tumor. In, and then after five and a half years of sunitinib, we decided we should take that kidney out, uh, although initially it would have been unwise to do surgery up front in somebody who has metastatic disease to brain, lungs, bone, and liver. So we proceeded when uh, he developed hypertension after five years of therapy. We stopped sunitinib, 
And after we controlled his blood pressure, went on and took his kidney out. And there was no viable tumor in his left kidney. I saw him two months ago, two years after stopping sunitinib. He has no evidence of recurrence. Next month will be two years since he had his nephrectomy. He's eight years without recurrence. I would like to end this because this is why we're here today, to give you hope. And I want to thank you personally, you, the patients, and your families for your trust and for participating in our clinical trials. You are the heroes who inspire us and remind us of the urgency of our research to make cancer history. Thank you.